Tonight on our century, the things we did to make a quid. When a day at the office could mean working up a sweat or hiding out in the secretarial pool. Miss Matthews? When you always seem to be late, and what your dad did, well, that's what you did. My dad was a steel worker, and so am I. And, of course, there was always the money. Yeah, naturally, I came here to get some bucks. Women trammies who work the same shift and hours and earn the same wages as the men. And it was the century where women opted for a fair day's pay too. Even brick laying, which I do at tech. I think, I think the girls could do a lot of those things. Now, at the start of our century, it was said that Australia and Argentina had the highest standard of living in the world. Certainly with a strong union movement here, Australian workers enjoyed better pay and work conditions than just about any place. By 1900, the revolutionary concept of an eight-hour workday was as Australian as gum trees. Eight hours work, eight hours play, and eight hours rest. And if you could rest and play on the boss's work time, well, that was also very Australian. For much of our century, work was hard yakka, like this, deep underground in the late 1940s, scraping a tunnel for a dam. Working with your hands, it was a hard way to make a quid. In Australia, jobs came with an image. Coal miners, farmers and nurses worked hard. Wharfies and public servants were loafers, and blokes with shovels spent most of the day leaning on them. Boys followed their fathers, whether he was a brickie, a boilermaker, or bent his back at BHP. My dad was a steel worker, and so am I. Steel, giant steel works, they're always in the back of your mind if you're a steel worker. It's in your blood. As Banjo Patterson said about Clancy, some of us could never suit the office, or the factory floor, or the dusty, dirty city. In 1949, Bob Cutler and his crew combed the rivers of the far north, as you could in those days, shooting crocodiles for their skins. Some other workers kept doing what Aussie workers had always done. Vic Deves and his trusty Bullock team stopped the clock. In 1969, they were still pulling timber out of the scrub in a way unchanged since the 1800s. That was Vic's job, the last of the Bullockies. For most Australians, though, work has become a day at the desk. Since 1970, white collars have outnumbered blue singlets and those who laid with their hands. In the late 1960s, it took an army of clerks to shuffle your tax returns. For these young people, getting a job in the nice, safe public service had become part of the Aussie worker's dream. As our century started, Australia's free education system gave working class children a chance their parents simply never had. A chance to become a pen pusher. For families who'd only ever known hard physical yakka, a job as a clerk for one of the kids was a giant step up the employment ladder. Next 
Sinatra, 15 and a half years old, has come to a sudden turn in the road. He must leave school and go to work. His father is very ill. There were lots of young Harrys and young Harriets. Ask your grandmother. She'll tell you that before the 1950s, most young people started work at 14 or 15, especially girls. The next morning, 15 and a half isn't very old after all. And getting your first job is a big step. That's the lad. Lads like Harry would become the envy of the workers of the world. With smokos, sickies, the bank holidays, the butcher's picnic, and the Queen's birthday long weekend. Weekday dreaming, Friday scheming to get away. But maybe half past four, then the world is yours for two whole days. To please yourself and no one else till Monday comes again. It's a holiday and all I want to say is have a good weekend. You got We worked, it seemed, to pay the bills and also to pay for the weekend. Forget about that Monday till it comes around You gotta dig right in and do your thing You got two whole days to spend So put the air guard can in the glove box And have a good weekend The Aussie love affair with the weekend is one of the great passions of our century. The weekend as we know it really came into its own in 1948. That's when the unions won the 40-hour week. Australia stopped work and closed shop from noon on Saturday to Monday morning. Mind you, the straight-laced weekend had been launched early in the century. That's when the churches and the temperance movement had pushed through a ban on Sunday trading. Sunday school and family picnics were all the go. Most shops were shut, and certainly every pub. But the rules did more than just shut the pubs. Some workers had gained the eight-hour day as long ago as the 1850s. So early, Western Australia was still importing convicts. When the new century dawned, we were determined to be progressive. And the Australian colonies of Victoria and South Australia were the first to have a minimum wage back in the 1890s. We called it the basic wage. It was all based on how much money a worker needed to live, not how much the boss was willing to pay. But for working women, it was an unmitigated disaster. In 1907, the basic wage had been calculated on the costs of a man with a wife and three children. It was assumed that when a girl married, she wouldn't need or want to work. So the cockeyed logic was, without a family to support, a single woman could get by on much less. Single or not, a man's basic wage was twice that of a woman. For most of our century, women were not only paid less, but often they had to quit their jobs the moment they married. go to school. To these girls, all is spares in love and war. So while the husband's away, the wife earns pay. On the home front, World War II blew away some of our most sacred work practices. With husbands and sons fighting overseas, Australian women had to man the tram tracks. And guess what? Amazingly, the country somehow kept going. That's in spite of the harebrained attempt at humour by Jack Davies' newsreel voice of the day. Look, girls, it's easy. You put the snop toggle into the burzen floch and hook it around the pushing. You pull on the millpiecen and nearly fall flat on your back platform. Ah, here, look. Uh, somebody else try. Ah, ah, the hand that can thread the needle can also rock the instructor. It's as easy as dragging your husband over the doorstep on a Saturday night. As the war dragged on, the government decided to crack the work whip. While the boys were away, the girls were not allowed to play. Ironically, women were now instructed to go out and get a job. Women whom manpower authorities regard as not gainfully employed may be among early recruits to the war effort. 
no great gulf separates the park equestrian from the Jillaroo, which of course is Jackaroo, feminine gender. The old order changes. The pastimes of peace fade and disappear. There is no place for idle hands. Total war means total effort. There can be none sitting in the sidelines looking on. After dragging them out of the kitchen, it was going to be hard to make women put the aprons back on. That had a taste of the cash and the confidence that comes with a job. Our returned soldiers were back on the factory front lines, with women now alongside them. The 1950s boom in consumer goods had begun. The sales pitch was all about making life for the little woman just a little bit easier. It was almost as if the advertisers thought that nothing had changed from the pre-war days. Buy a nice refrigerator like this one. Roomy, modern, well insulated, an ornament to any kitchen. This was a movie ad from the 1930s, when only a few Australian homes had a fridge and next to nobody had a washing machine. If Australian women had a work wish list, everyone agrees the washing machine would be the number one wish. In the days before the twin tub and the whirlpool, how did marriages ever survive those Monday blues? Oh well, Hilda started the day of drudgery. The sorting, the rubbing and scrubbing, and after the rubbing comes the pegging out. Then the evening meal. There's Hilda's dog tired, too tired for cooking. And the usual quarrel when Hugh comes home to a dull tired wife and a dull cold meal. Stop! This can't go on. Two step, mate. One fourth move, and it's a long way to the bottom. The fact is, more Australians die on the job than on the road. In the 1950s, the building workers made a film warning their members of how dangerous making a quid could be. This film was a grim reminder that high-powered ramps at guns and saws that cut through anything could give you more than a bad headache. I'm not doing too bad now. I've got enough fingers left to write with. But I'd be doing a lot better if I hadn't got too used to that circular saw. The circular saw had left its mark on his hand and scarred his life. But fall off a building and you'd lose much more than your fingers. These bridge builders of the 1920s and 30s risked their lives every day, climbing higher than any Australian construction worker had ever been. Sixteen of their mates died building this spectacular coat hanger, the symbol of Australia. Recently I spoke to you about the need for safety on the job. High up in the snowy mountains, Safety was again a problem, as workers built the biggest dream that we'd ever dreamt. Give me a man who's a man among men, who stole his white collar and put down his pen. We'll blow down a mountain and build you a dam. During the 50s and 60s, it was Australia's equivalent of putting man on the moon. Over 25 years from 1949, it seized our national imagination. Building 16 dams and seven power stations to irrigate eastern Australia and provide power for industry. And workers certainly earn their money. Three times the national average. That's if you could hack it. The snowy also challenged some of the oldest Aussie work practices. When things fell behind schedule, the American contractors who took over didn't quite appreciate traditions like the smoker. 
the next morning, Curly came along and there happened to be Smoko. And Curly found a lot of men sitting around a fire boiling the billy. What's going on here, he said. And they explained that Smoko and they, well, he's just going to boil the billy and have a cup of tea. Not on my job, he said. And with that, he gave the billy a great kick and it went sailing through the... <laughs> And he sent them all back to work, and then he issued thermoses to every man. And they, if they wanted tea, they could, you know, they could uh, drink it as they went along in their trucks. The giant hydro scheme sparked the huge migration programs that lit up Australia after the war. These new arrivals were essential. Without them, the snowy scheme could never have been started. These Europeans brought their culture as well as their minds and their muscle. Collins Street in sedate Melbourne goes positively continental with umbrellas on the footpath and the city's first boulevard cafe. You expect this in Gay Paris, but this is Melbourne. Now, it doesn't look like much, but this was the start of an industrial revolution. Over the next 40 years, most of the new jobs in Australia would be in the service industries. Everything from food waiters to financial wizards. What you're staring at, mate, you from Sydney, I suppose. Keys and no one clattering them. The answer is in a pianola roll, or at least something that looks like a pianola roll. Back then, the information technology seemed pretty harmless. The whiz-bang automatic typewriter could best be described as a novelty instrument for the office. What we didn't understand was that this was going to get rid of the typing pool. By 1974, computers had arrived. As salesmen sang their praises, the government made rosy predictions that the paperless office was just around the corner. The computer age, we were told optimistically, meant that all we had to do was work out how best to spend our new leisure time. For many Australian workers, there'd now be plenty of that. They'd be on the dock. Within just a decade, computers had changed the Australian workplace. It's the way it's become. This is a good firm. No one, you know, there's no denying it. But, you know, and you've got a situation of last year uh, with a Honeywell computer upstairs, and they sent me, I'm wanting to know if anyone wanted to be retrained. That was in the morning. The word came down before lunchtime that we were all too old to be retrained. Of course, for others, the new century promises job prospects and profits beyond the imagination. Alex Hartman was a 16-year-old schoolboy when he sold his computer program that makes it easier to connect to the internet. Now just think, at the start of our century, young Australians like Alex left school dreaming that they'd make a quid by becoming the company clerk. Today, they can leave school and become instant millionaires. In 1900, most Australians made a quid by working with their hands. As you've seen, it was pretty hard yakka. But the old blue singlet and work boot days have been replaced by the new age computer. And every classroom has got one. But back in 1900, there were only five high schools in all of Australia. And all of them were in New South Wales. In 1900, kids left school at 12 or 13. But today, the lesson is if you want a job, then get an education. Stay at school as long as you can. And when you leave school, go to university or TAFE and study some more. century book is now available wherever good books are sold. For all the memories and images of the past 100 years, be sure to get your copies soon. Until we punch the ticket and stick it in the rack, we're just numbers. 